Greetings, everybody. I'm Florence Neal again, artist, uh, co-founder and director of the Kentler International Drawing Space, which is in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we're 32 years devoted to drawings, prints, and works on paper. And uh, yeah, so I'm really pleased to uh, Kentler host the third Mokuhanga uh, Short Talks. That's our new name for Pecha Kucha. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce Keiko Kobayashi, who's going to be your host today. And um, in the meantime, I'm letting people in and moderating this. Keiko Kobayashi started making Mokuhanga on her own terms in around 1990. She moved to Moscow in the early 1990s to learn Russian language and stayed there until 2019. She was a member of the Senjes Senej Printing Center from 2000 and made etchings and monotype works, participating in some international mini print competitions. She was asked to show how to make water-based woodblock prints at an art opening in Moscow, Prostaya Skola, and then first came to MeLab in 2017 for more practice precise skills and knowledge. In 2018, Keiko, in collaboration with Prostaya Scala and MeLab organized an international event, Mokuhanga workshop and exhibition called Mo Globalizing Mokuhanga, Tokyo and Moscow, in the framework of the year of Japan and Russia. She worked as a coordinator for the fourth International Mokuhanga Conference in 2021 and now she's working as the administrator of Siashi Mi Lab. Thank you, Keiko. Thank you, Florence, for uh, introducing me. Uh, my name is Keiko Kobayashi. I'm today's uh, moderator. Nice to see you together today. Uh, thank you, Florence, again, for the introduction and for your help in organizing this meeting. Actually, Florence and I were discussing about this meeting with Ralph in the, uh, the early July. So um, it is still unbelievable for me that he isn't with us uh, here today. So uh, we'd like to, uh, and uh, excuse me, and he also made a big contribution uh, to hold the first and the second uh, meetings successfully. So we would like to dedicate today's meeting to the memory of Raru. Uh, today, we have three excellent presenters, Mel Cheon in Macau, Sayaka Kawamura in Japan, and Rosalind Keen in Australia. The first presenter is Mel Cheon. Mel Cheon is advisor of International Mokuhanga Association in Asia region president of Macau Woodblock Print Association, secretary general of the Printmaking Research Center of Macau, and 2021 Arts for Good Fellows in Singapore. Uh, she is engaged in design, printmaking education, children's education, etc. She actively studies the possibility of printmaking in daily applications. Mel has also participated in many overseas artist residency uh, programs and actively uh, curate project of Macau artists to be engaged in overseas exhibitions. She's one of the curator of the Curiouser and Curiouser project, which aims to celebrate the Children's International Day as well as showcasing them the possibilities in art. Today, Mel will talk on the theme, Breaking the Boundaries, Mokuhanga for Installation, Paper Sculpture, and Mixed Media. Uh, okay, Mel, please start your presentation. Okay, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Once again, Thank you everyone for coming and thank you Kiko-san's invitation, as well as Miss Florence Neal at Kleda Drawing to host this short talk. 
This is Mel Zhang from Macau, and it is a small city next to Hong Kong, southeast of Asia. I start copper plate etching in Macau, and then I was seeking a non-toxic pre-making method and shift to Mukranga. At first, I learned the basic from Macau and Taiwan with a little bit trials and errors, as the studio that I went to do not have a proper woodblock course, course or curriculum at that time. This picture on our right hand side show the wood block that I use for the work presented at IMC 2014. It's really a chopping board. And then in 2017, I got the advanced course a mission to pursue Mukwanga as my further study at the Mi Lab. And my journey of Mukwanga started from there. The topic of this talk is breaking the boundaries in which I want to talk about my approach to use to present Mokranga in an alternative way, presenting you my projects on installation, paper crafts, and more. Like many others, my Mokranga just started with 2D works. At that time, I was fond of the Portuguese tiles design called azulejos, which same tiles are repeat itself to form a pattern. And this was the image that I presented to Milab. The one I made was the color of spring. And printing itself requires a lot of repeating steps, which at the same time clear my mind in the Hassel city. My first time to integrate Mokranga into an installation comes in Yamanashi, Japan, where a curator, Miss Yoko Kanda, wants to create a project for Asento or we call a public house, a public bathhouse. The center is owned by a local family, but as the grandma is becoming old, she decided to change to the center to an art center where she can still enjoy the linkage with the community. Okay, Yoko-san tells me the history of the center and she wants me to exhibit something with that theme. And I stare at the blank, background of the Sento, which gave me a sense of missing. The Mount Fuji is not there. Yoko-san told me that usually the owner would find a painter to draw a Mount Fuji image at the back. But as the income of a Sento become less, it is difficult to hire a painter. So my first installation comes out. It is to make a Mount Fuji Mokwanga print with 14 times 32 tiles. It matches the exact tile size at the background. And I want to give this work to the center as to glorify this particular movement that resemble a second life to the center. I mentioned a while ago that when I repeat prints, re repeat making prints, the action soothes my mind. I think Mukwanga helped me a lot, especially in 2019 when I saw the fall of Hong Kong. A lot of bad news comes out every day and it was really depressing. I try not to follow the news. The question itself is which side could I take? And my second installation comes out. It talks about the meaning of truth and it is a repeat movement, but in different colors. It represents the ideas of hand printing posters. We call them big character posters during the 80s, where we can have freedom of speech and we can stick whatever you want to say on the wall. So coming back to 2019, the drawing line of truth becomes very slim. As all the works that I printed are truth, at the same time, only the one on the, on the block is the truth. I always remember what Conan said, it means there's only one truth. And I have to live with this idea in my mind. The second thing I always do with my Mukwanga is my paper crafts. Actually, I did a lot of paper crafts when I was small and it brings me back a lot of good memories. Where we use our hands to make toys, and I imagine that I will make toys for my kid in the future so he can sit down with me and do some simple wood blocks. I decided many small paper crafts projects such as the tangerine, a bird, a small booklet, etc. And recently, 
I'm thinking about the Sumbobu project too. This is how I usually work. I join those paper craft community and look for the things that they make with paper. And then I think of a way to present it in a sheet of A4 size paper so that I can test out in my community. My kit now is too small to do it so I can create work. I hope I can create work that everyone can enjoy too. So that comes to my recent works and the final projects that I want to talk about today. I quitted, Mukwang, I, I quitted copper plate etching because I planned to be a mother. In any case, I need to prepare an alternative way to do my art even I'm pregnant. So I always dream that I'm, when I'm pregnant, I have a lot of time to work on my wood blocks. I bought a lot of wood home when I know I'm pregnant and planted a lot of images. Not to mention something funny, I had them all in pink and think that I had a daughter. <laughs> and imagine that she will explore all the things in a curious way, like Alice in Wonderland. First of all, my baby is a son. Secondly, I vomited a lot at the first few months after I know that I'm pregnant and I didn't actually vomit but it is just that I couldn't bear the smell of wood and want to form it. And my weight struggled struggle to go up, even my baby is growing. So I waited outside my studio door, patiently eating. When I can go outside my studio, my tummy is already very big that I can barely sit in front of my table to cough. I didn't do much of my work and I couldn't make many of my plans and promises for exhibitions. So I have to seek another alternative way again. If you learn Mukuranga from Milab, after putting the washi on the block, we put a sheet of baking paper in between washi and the baron when printing. I do not want to waste buying a lot of baking paper at home. So I have been using a very thin printing theme instead. This idea is just that one side of the theme has to be rough to stand on the washi and the other side must be smooth for the baron to slide. And these are the themes that I'm using. And I made a lot of circles with them. They got all the images and colors from my past and they allowed me to do college now and transcend my time to my future works. I do not use glue on this project. Rather, after being a mother, I enjoy stitching again. I enjoy the time that I slowly do some motherly work. And now I ran out of these plastic themes already. So I can start doing my new mukuranga with my son ready to sit in my studio. So feel free to follow my Instagram for new work. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go ahead. The second presenter is Sayaka Kawamura. Uh, Sayaka Kawamura was graduated from printmaking course of Kyoto Seika University in 2013 and took a master's degree from Tama Art University in 2015. She has been working as an assistant for graphic art course of Tama Art University since 2021. She has won such prizes as the Museum Prize at Tokyo International Mini Print Trainale 2018, Grand Prix at the 11th Coach International Print Trainale in 2020, and Constellation Studios Award at the first International Mokuhanga Conference in 2021. She actively holds solo exhibitions and participates in group exhibitions. She was selected as one of six artists for Ueno Artist Project 2021, Everyday Life, I Am Born Again, shown at Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. Today, Sayaka will talk on the theme to look at wood blocks to know expressions, demonstrations, and explanation of painting. Uh, when Sayaka comments her works, uh, she will speak in Japanese, uh, but English trans uh, interpretation will follow it. So Sayaka, please start your presentation. Okay. 
Hi, good morning. I'm Sayaka Kamura. Uh, I will now give a presentation on my wax and uh, print technique. Uh, uh, I will be speaking today with subtitle on the material. じゃあ、スタートします。あ、聞こえます。ここの部分はただあの、スライドショーで流していきますかそうですね。あ、わかりました。ファースト、はい。コメント参りますかあ、えっと、最後だけ。最後だけ。あ、ファースト、I uh, 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 will show you some works in slide in the slide show. Then she will comment her works. So please watch. えっと、私は記憶をと故郷をテーマに作品を制作しています。あ、ちょっと待ってください。あ、what she is speaking is now you can see in the subtitle. はい。はい。記憶とて、記憶と故郷をテーマに作品を制作しています。人は皆そのような場所を持っていれば、どこへ行っても自分が自分であるという考え方が私にはあります。そこから出発して人間関係ができていきます。だからどのようなポジションにいても自分が自分でいれば自己完結することができると考えています。頭の中に残るいくつもの故郷の風景、そしてどこか懐かしい誰でもないき誰かの記憶を集めては和紙にすり取り私なりの記憶の場面として作品に残しています。水星木版が独特の木目と色彩、そして人物と合わさった和紙
Uh, this is my studio. Uh, tatami room. Uh, uh, next, you will be asked to watch a demonstration video. Uh, this is an image of the work. The video so you will uh, watch a video uh, when uh, Sayaka is demonstrating, demonstrating how to print the face. Mm -hmm. Uh, I start printing from the person's hair and face, and uh, I use a bearing baren called Yuki baren for wood blocks with large color parts such as hair. Uh, I print face next. For printing a uh, face, the integral technique is used partially for eyes and nose. In order to put the paint into the integral part, I use a brush with thin bristles called mensofude. Uh, 
Finally, I fixed the paint to the block with a small hacke brush. Printing a face is so delicate that I use a home button. Sayaka, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you for your sharing your special technique to print uh, your face. It was very interesting. So uh, let's go ahead. The third presenter is Roslyn Keen. Uh, Roslyn Keen first studied at the National Arts School and uh, Solid to Design School, Sydney, followed by postgraduate studies in printmaking at the State School of Fine Art, London. In 1985, she was awarded a research scholarship by the Japanese government to attend the printmaking department, the National University of Fine Art, Tokyo, to undertake postgraduate studies in traditional Japanese woodblock printing. Since 1985, uh, Roslyn Keen has been uh, preoccupied with printmaking traditions of Japan, conducting master classes in the technique in printmaking studio and universities throughout Australia. Currently, she is the director of a Stables Print Studio, Sydney, where she shares her expertise in woodblock techniques. Today, Roslyn will talk on the theme in search of Mokuhanga in Tibet. Um, what I'd like to share with you all is when I was completing my studies in um, Tokyo in 1987, I was also working part-time teaching English to a lovely Japanese lady who owned restaurants that specialized in shoujin rori, which is the um, ancient Buddhist food of Tibet. Her restaurant was called Bon, and Bon is one of the oldest religions of Tibet. And this got me thinking about continuing my research um, in Tibet, looking for traditional printing. So my journey here is to, or my intention here is to um, also acknowledge all the time that Ralph spent in China, in Asia and doing research and take you on a short journey in Tibet in search of traditional woodblock printing. So when you arrive in Lhasa, you arrive at three and a half thousand meters, which um, it takes a little bit of climatizing to, to get going and get motivated. Um, and everything you do is, is, is incredibly um, enduring because you're so many flights of stairs to all the monasteries to try and do, to get access into things. This is the Batala in Lhasa, and that just gives you an idea of the scale of the monasteries. Now, I thought this would be fairly simplistic. I'll go off to Tibet and I'll try and find some woodblock, woodblock printing. Well, of course, there's, I don't speak Tibetan. I don't have any way to um, formally ask people, um, you know, where am I going to find these printers? So I started to realize that whenever I saw prayer flags, that, that something was being printed locally um, and these prayer flags were all being done by hand in the monasteries. So that was a little bit of a clue for me to get started. Um, I would find myself in monasteries with just numerous corridors and doors and, um, and, and no signage whatsoever. And people just amazed that, you know, this foreigners wandering around with a camera documenting everything, but I couldn't speak to anybody. 
Um, I would start to go back in the evenings and draw all the doors that I remembered that I'd looked behind. And um, often I'd just find a monk doing prayer or I'd find a kitchen or I'd find another long corridor to another, another room full of, you know, individual quarters for the monks. So it became a real challenge to sort of how am I, I've got three weeks in Tibet, how on earth am I going to actually discover any printmaking? And of course, I was there at a time when there was an uprising in Tibet in 1988. Um, and so foreigners were not really in, being invited to travel too far. You'd be told you can't get that bus because there's a black peril and you're in danger of getting sick if you travel to certain areas. And, and it was really difficult. Um, I took thousands of photographs. What I did do is I took with me um, a lot of photocopies of the Dalai Lama. So when I was in very, very remote parts and I was trying to find information about a monastery or try to relate the fact that I was looking for printing, I would offer a photograph of the Dalai Lama. And this is an example of this wonderful gentleman that came out to the roadside because I was waiting to catch a bus in a remote outskirts of the town. And I offered him a photograph of the Dalai Lama. And it was this immediate communication with people um, that I respected the Dalai Lama. And they in turn started to offer directions or, or point me in the direction of a monastery. Um, so this is one of the monasteries where I did have success. Um, outside of Shigatsi and you would end up in a courtyard within the monastery and I was being instructed to go to the rooftop so here's an example of, of a typical rooftop view from a monastery in Tibet in the very bottom right you can see some doorways well they're actually curtains hanging in doorways um, and I was to there's two different doors here um, but I ventured through one of these doors and I was fortunate to find these gentlemen printing. Um, they were printing in, in minimal daylight. There was a tiny window um, with a beam of light coming through. And I don't know whether they were legally printing because at this time China was not happy with Tibet and it was um, actually destroying many, many of the monasteries and many of the libraries were destroyed during this period. The Dalai Lama had fled Tibet back in 1959, um, I think it was. And so th this period of time was quite unsettling in Tibet. Um, and these monks, I think, were actually in secret printing. So this, the few photographs that I have take you into this particular chamber where they were working. Um, it's interesting, this box on the floor, the date is the 11th of the 10th, 1945. So this probably hasn't moved. So it's now 77 years ago that um, I was there. I mean, sorry, that that box would have sat there. These are typical of the blocks that they were printing on that particular day. Um, I'll give you, a, this is just a detail of a block. So the area around the text is all carved away so that the text ends up being in sort of a raised platform um, for access to put the ink on. It, you can't see the height so much there. There's a demarcation line where the paper sits at the end of the block. And what we're looking at, I think, is a very primitive use of a tool we would call a baron. Um, but this printing wheel with a cloth wrapped around it is what they were taking an impression with. Very, very basic, incredibly basic. Um, here's the inking of a block. And there was a huge black um, carbon-like slab next to them that they were dabbing. There was also numerous tins that to me looked like tins of shoe polish. So I really don't know what type of ink that they were printing. As they were working, they kept asking me for some more money and more money to keep working and to take, for me to take photographs. Um, and we reached a point where I, the money's all on the table. I completely emptied my pockets of any money I had on me. And then at that point, they downed tools and refused to keep printing. So in this photograph, we can see the black inking slab. Um, in front of them, 
the wheel, which I would guess they probably rewrap occasionally because when they're printing, they're, they're printing both sides of the paper at once. So the ink doesn't seem to smudge when they turn it over and roll the wheel across it. Um, and here's one of my last photographs of, of these printers. They totally decided to stop printing. I was pretending that my camera was faulting and I needed to take more photos. And I managed to turn sideways. Oh, that's just a close up on a block. I managed to turn sideways and look down the corridor behind me to where there were some blocks stored. Um, some of the blocks had so much dust on them. I mean, I, I don't know, the Japanese written language, uh, sorry, the Tibetan language script evolved from the seventh century as when Buddhism came into Tibet. So some of these blocks could be hundreds of years old. Um, it's hard to know. And, and some of them have special, special shrouds tied to them, which means that particular perhaps chapter in the book um, is incredibly special. That one block contains a really, really important scripture. So this is a photograph of one of many, many corridors of blocks. And unfortunately, many of the monasteries have been destroyed. These, these libraries have actually been destroyed. Um, through um, China's you know, involvement in Tibet. I'm not gonna to get too political, but it's really sad to see that there's been so much destruction and, and that a lot of these blocks end up in markets. Um, the locals collect the blocks and actually sell them in the marketplace. So both in Nepal and Tibet, you can find blocks like this for sale. Um, there's no way of dating them, knowing their age. Um, they're amazing, amazing old blocks. This is one I purchased in Nepal um, at a later trip. So this particular journey that I made to Tibet in 1988 um, was a huge influence on my work. Um, it was so exciting to actually, after studying in Japan, to go somewhere and see the source of, of um, woodblock printing that evolved and carried through Buddhism into Japan. Um, the, the practices I think would still be happening in Tibet. Um, the, I've just included a few images of my work made at the time that were directly influenced from visiting some of the monasteries. Um, the ceilings in the monasteries have the most extraordinary cobalt blue painted in them. And I used a lot of cobalt blue for many years in my works. I use a lot of gilding, um, using the Japanese methods of gilding. With this, this is pure mokohanga that we're looking at. Um, this is white gold. And I use mica powder, the decorative elements of mica powder. And more recently, um, this is now feeling a combination of my experiences from both Japan and, and research in China. And this is the work I made for Sumi Fusion that um, arrived back a couple of days ago. Thank you, Keiko. Um, and a more recent work. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. So does anybody want to ask? to the presenters or your comments. Um, I saw a question to me in the chat and mm -hmm. uh, okay. Oh Suzanne, oh, thank you. Suzanne, Miss Suzanne Hara Herhera. Her, yeah mm -hmm. asked me uh, whether mm -hmm. I put watercolor layers first or print with oil based layer under watercolor. And actually I usually just use watercolor. But I, I wonder why, I think uh, Saka San's um, print are so light in color while my, my colors are always so vivid because I use a lot of paint. <laughs> well, she may add more water there, right? I, I guess only. Did you got the answer you need? Yeah, yeah. She uh, just mentioned earlier um, in the presentation that there were mm -hmm. Sometimes where she used oil base, 
um, with the brayer. Um, and so I was curious, like, if that always had to be on top of the watercolor, or if the oil base caused problems, um, if it was underneath watercolor. Mm, okay. And would you, would you like to ask the same question to Sayaka? She said uh, first she paint oil based, uh, she, uh, she paint with oil based paint and then watercolor. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, are you interested in the um, percentage of the paint and water? Yeah, I'm, cu I'm curious about um, if there's any trouble or issue with the the thicker oil based ink being underneath watercolor because I know you um, and I've done it myself you can print the oil base on top of watercolor mm. ink but I'm I've never tried I kind of assumed mm. that it would be a problem having oil based underneath even if you dried it mm. first because it's sort of mm -hmm. almost kind of laminated on the paper um, and I mean really anybody could answer that question but it was brought uh, okay. up in the presentation I go to uh, let's ask Sayaka because she said uh, in this way, she can take advantage of both types of paint. Yes. あ、すいません、川村さん、あの、今、あの、油性とそれから水性を併合併用するってことについての質問なんですけど、えっと、質問しているスザンナさんは、あの、水性を吸った後で大体油性のインクを上から乗せてるんですけど、川村さん逆を
So she started to tell me a little bit about the history of her restaurants. And then I got fascinated in looking up and researching things about Bonn. And then that took me, of course, to looking at old sutras and prayers. And then I thought, why not? I'll just go. In fact, I was to return to Australia and I cashed in my Japanese Monbusho, Japanese government business class return airfare and was able to come home via Tibet for three weeks, for nearly four weeks in Tibet. So um, it was just circumstance and conversation and digging deeper into the history of woodblock printing. So, and, and I was so naive, just thinking I'll go off to Tibet, you know, not realizing the political unrest and everything that was going on in Tibet. But wow. I didn't even, I don't know if you can travel freely like I did at the time. Um, I was a bit of a novelty, I think. But I, I had no way of knowing where I was going to find any printing. It was sheer luck that I did in the end. Okay. And so in your in your research, I guess, would you say that it's as old as Japan or you, you can't know yet, as yet? Like as a as a method of printing? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to um, you know, when you come from somewhere like Australia, it's such a it, it's such a huge historical you know, difference um, to grow up in such a new, fresh, young country and to just get to the um, get to the source of so many things. So starting to look into book art and old books in Japan, the history of ukiyo-e, the history of, of, you know, the elaborate woodblock prints takes you back into book art, takes you back into Buddhist writings, Buddhist printings, which took me back into to, Tibet, basically. And the line of Buddhism that came to Japan through the north of China, as opposed to the south of China, um, there was a connection there with, uh, I remember um, Kurosaki doing a presentation at the first conference on the history of the Baron. And the Baron was part of the inventory of, um, in a Buddhist temple, you, you had the basic, basic um, kit for doing printing that would be let that that was that belonged to the monastery or to the, the temple and would be um either lent out or used in the temple so it was a similar thing in in tibet to try and get to the origins of all of that does that make sense the, yeah thank you thank you he was an artist just trying to investigate you know raw materials what people are using the origins of of what we're all practiced here now it's um it's interesting it hasn't changed that much. Um, the only thing I would have loved to know is what actual ink they were, what their ink was made of. I'm sure there was some yak fat in there somewhere because everything was, everything in Tibet is um, utilizing yak fat as a binder, as, as you know, their source of fuel. Um, anyway, my next life, I'll be a historian. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> oh, yes, please. Andrew, hello. It's very dark over here. Good morning. I have a question to each of the participants um, about uh, scale, the size of their works. Um, I'm very impressed by Saka-san's, uh, the size of the work behind her. And the few works I've seen have been much larger than <clears throat> I'm usually used to seeing in Mokohanga. And uh, I'm curious also, Rosalind, how big your works are and how much the size of the work uh, plays a part in, in what you're trying to accomplish. And that's also true of uh, Mel. I notice your, in your large tile work obviously deals with scale by making a large piece from multiples of small works. So just curious to hear um, what part scale plays in how you plan your work and how important it is to either work big um, when small is so often more common. あの、サイズを教えてほしいそうなんですけど、非常にあの、後ろに大きいプリントがあって、あの、面白い興味を持ったんですけど、どのぐらいのサイズのものをいつも知っていますか大体70センチ×70センチ、なんか700×1000。
Okay. Uh, so how about you, Roslyn? Um, I think with regard to scale, because I exhibit um, broadly amongst a lot of other printmakers and internationally with the Biennales and, you know, it seems large work has become more popular or panels of work. With Mokuhanger, it is such a challenge to do, to do panels and have everything align perfectly when you're doing individual um, prints in the moisture, the paper, the stretch and have them aligned. But I, I don't know, I, I started, I used to run the screen printing department at the Slade School of Art back in the, um, the late seventies after I graduated there and everybody was working large poster size. I think scale is just something I've inherited through my own practice of printmaking and I've adapted Mokuhanga to, um, the, print, the prints might be big, but there's a lot of small elements get printed into the prints rather than trying to print very large individual sections. So that's the way to manage large scale for me is to, it's like putting all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together, like all the small pieces go together to make up the big work. Um, but, it, but, you know, traditional, traditional mokuhanger hanger is in proportion to the human scale. And, and printers sat and didn't stand to print. And so I think we're really pushing it to the limits with really large work. It, there is a point where it's just physically not sensible um, for the complexity of the work anyway. So I don't know. I've started, I've started um, making several panels to make up one, one composite work. So that's, I'm, I'm still getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, it's interesting. Uh, Mel, how about you? I think I do the size depending on the image first. So if I want this size, like the current ones that I'm making is about a girl. So it's more or less the size of Sayaka San's ones because I want it to be like, if you put in, in front of you, it looks like you are looking at the person. So this is what the scale should be. And if it's like uh, the tiles or things like that, well, you, you, I always think about what I want to, what I want my audience to think when they look at my print. So it depends. Well, sometimes I want some small dedicated work. So uh, it's for people to put in their bedroom or on the table of their uh, working or, or their working table so they can enjoy smaller works instead of bigger ones. So yeah, it, well, at the end of the day, I just, I, I just think about how I want to present it. So I didn't, didn't make it like everything should be big or everything should be small. So I don't have this kind of uh, rules in my, uh, for my prints. And Mel, Is that, uh, can I answer you your question? <laughs> yeah, uh, Andrew. Uh, okay, I have a question to Mel. Uh, you may you often make a big installation, and how about the size of the installation? What was the biggest one? And the second question is: Is it, your installation consist of small prints, many small prints, or you print sometimes a large one? For installation, uh, actually, I have one that the biggest one that I'm I I do is to print on a very big cloth, and then I use the cloth to make balls, mm -hmm. and I put it I put it in a seven meter times seven meters times thirty meters high because it's a like a mm -hmm. sculpture and chinkling. Uh, like like a grapes <laughs> grapes falling down from the sky. So that mm -hmm. one should be the largest one that I made with Mukanga. And what is the second question again? Sorry. Ah, uh, so uh, do you sometimes print a large print like Sayaka-san? Yeah, or yeah, you, yeah, you make your installations from small prints? Installation usually should be made with so small prints because mm -hmm. I, I make it repeat and then it combines together. So it's mm -hmm. not like making big 
ones and combine together. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Usually it's from the small because for installation, I have to look at the area. I have to look at the, the, the location that I'm going to make the installation first before I decided what how how scale would it become like the bath house room uh, the the public bathroom uh, bath house one i have to go there and see okay what size can i make and i come back home and do it and there are many of my installation i have to look at the area first before i do my thinking of what i should make so it's a reverse reverse progress instead of okay i make this thing and i want to put somewhere put it somewhere there's a question in the chat box about um mm -hmm. really get inspiration for your work through your own dreams Ask i just want to respond and say um my work really comes from the the memories of the experience of of being in a place it's it's not so much dreaming it's the the memory of place oh. that i じゃあ、イメージ、うん、考えなさんのインスピレーションのもとは夢でしょうかっていう質問です。イメージ Oh, that, that's, that was my question. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yeah, yes. yes yeah, I, can. I, was, I was just wondering, um, just based on like the dreamlike style of your art, if you do incorporate some of your own dreams into your own work with along, along with your memories of your childhood. God, so mm -hmm. do you often yeah. hear dreams? Yes, yes. Yeah. It might be interesting to uh, take inspiration from my dreams in my childhood because there were some interesting stories. What, what paper do you use? Uh, and this, I use the Tosawashi. Tosawashi. Tosawashi, mm -hmm. Japanese paper, and uh, and uh, Ichizen no uh, Awagami papers. No, Washi of Katte Maske. Yaku present cause or discuss. Is it a hundred percent causal? Mm -mm, hundred percent. All causal. Mm. Ah, Tosawashi no? Tosawashi. Mm. Ah, like a mecha simple de Tosawashi number one. Number one. Number one. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so Saika use this, uh, usually use this uh, Tosawashi number one <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> use this a causal paper from Ichizen and Awagami. Hello, can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Yes, hi. Um, I'm interested in whether the, um, the artists are using a um, sizing with their paper or do they print sometimes without sizing? Thank you. Okay, so... Uh... じゃあ、さやかさんアゲン。あの、動作が引いてあるかみを使っていますかそれとも動作なしのものも使いますかああ、最近は動作を引いた紙を使ってます。とさわしはすべて動作引いてます。ああ、え、え、え、え、え、え
to help carry all the layers of printing that I'm going to put into it. So um, especially on a large scale, if you were working on sized, it would become quite unmanageable. So for me, um, sizing is important. So yes, definitely sizing, but, but moderate, soft to moderate, not heavily sized. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mel, uh, how about you? My paper, I bought my paper at the oh, Osu, Osuwashi is Hanshi paper. So mm -hmm. I think it's precise also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. That, I'm sorry. That, um, the, the commonality that you that you're talking about. Are you talking about that as a as the sort of craft base or materials base or or, or something more about perception? I'm just intrigued. That, oh, I think I think it's probably material based that the whole exercise is derived from wood and tools mm -hmm. and the ink. You know the the type of innovative imagery, the type of innovative use of paper, the you know, there'd be something wrong if we weren't advancing and changing, but there's a lot to be respected by what was practiced for hundreds of years as a practice and, and what we can still learn from it. It's, um, it's so important when you're a young artist to do some research and to explore, you know, some of the traditional ways um, that can easily be lost mm. or the knowledge, the knowledge of the very traditional methods. Yeah, I agree. It's very important to study uh, tradition, not to lose it, and uh, uh, to know its root. Uh, it may give you a new inspiration and new power of expression, I think. Yeah, it's something I'll always remember Ralph for, that Ralph was able to bring to our conferences and our talks some extraordinary research and um, history in the process mm -hmm. to acknowledge where we've come from to where we are today in a contemporary practice. So um, again, thank you, Ralph. Yes. Yeah. Well, we might be running out of time that I, that I allotted because we started early. So I don't wanna end suddenly, but it's really been wonderful. Thank you so much, Keiko. And and all thank you so much. It's been really great. So we're trying to continue these every what two or three months, and the next one will be in a different time zone and sort of U.S. somewhere, and then we'll keep going. Um, please tell everyone about this. There's there's actually a form that we'll send out again that you can apply. You can submit a proposal but we're also taking uh, suggestions and um, want to keep these conversations alive between us. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. <laughs>